What you are about to hear is the incredible testimony of former witch doctor Emmanuel Amos of Nigeria, Africa. You will hear Emmanuel's true story of his entrance into deep witchcraft and his deliverance from it by the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of the phrases have been slightly adapted from the original manuscript for clarity to English speakers. Delivered from the Powers of Darkness by Emmanuel Amos Chapter 1 My Escape to New Life Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22.6 This is a story of God's works, mighty, wonderful, and mysterious, in obedience to the command of Jesus Christ, to me, saying, Go, and testify what I have done for you. One usually thinks of misfortune as an act of fate, and that we can do nothing to alter the events of our lives. To an extent, this is true. In the case of a child of God, his life is planned. Proverbs 16, 9. Whether that plan is fulfilled or not depends on a number of factors. The individual's closeness to God, his view about the ultimate purpose of life, and the socio-spiritual environment in which he finds himself. The course of your life is challenged by some external forces. The crisis is reached when you give over your will one way or the other, for good or evil. You can love or hate. You can wish to understand or misunderstand. The will to obey is the greatest force of a newborn Christian, while the will to disobey is the most destroying force of the sinner. A child, when left alone in the world, is controlled by one of two powers, good or bad, right or wrong, God or the devil. Everyone is challenged by these two forces of life, and each one must choose which life he must live. And I believe that is what the Bible says. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he grows he will not depart from it. You will agree that the dearest and closest person to any child's heart is his mother. An orphan is an unfortunate child, and more exposed to attacks of the devil than children with parents. A mother is a protector of body and soul, but it becomes double tragedy when both parents are lost, and more so in most mysterious circumstances. My story started 22 years ago in a little village called Amari Iriegbu Ozu Aitim in Bindi, local government authority, Emo State. My parents were not classified amongst the rich, but my dad was privileged to inherit 42 hectares of land from my grandfather, a blessing which has today brought the greatest misfortune ever recorded in the history of the family. My dad was greatly envied by his distant and near relations for reasons I do not know, perhaps for his vast land inheritance. We were a happy family, my parents having got four of us, Love, Margaret, Emmanuel, and Chinier. After having the first two daughters, my parents waited for fourteen years before having me, the only son, and later my younger sister Chinier. This brought real happiness to the family, but this happiness was short-lived as the first tragedy struck. My lovely and caring mother died. She was alleged to have died owing to witchcraft, and four years later my father died, again through an alleged work of juju, involved against him. Two years after the death of both parents, my eldest sister, Love, disappeared mysteriously, and Margaret, the second daughter of my parents, went mental. It was a chain of tragedies in the life of a humble and otherwise happy family. My youngest sister, Chinier, and I were sent to our grandparents. There, I completed my elementary education, and was later admitted into Item High School. I read up to Class 3, and dropped out of school as a result of lack of fund for fees, etc. Shortly after that, my grandparents also died. After all the ceremonies that go with burials, an unknown relation collected my younger sister Chinier, and up to this date I do not know her whereabouts. I was forced by severe maltreatments to go back to my father's house, and there to live alone at the age of thirteen years. How does a child of thirteen years feed himself in the midst of his father's enemies, and consequently his own enemies? How very afraid I was! These events seemed to have brought me to the end of worthwhile living. Was there anyone who cared? Was there anyone who was concerned about a little boy's misfortune? One day, I met a friend I knew during my elementary school days, named Chinadum Onwukwe. Chinadum loved me very much, and having heard all that befell me, took me to his parents who readily received me and took me as a second son. Life came back to normal again. I was well cared for. I was happy again. Then I knew that the God my mother prayed to when she was alive was alive somewhere, hence he had provided me with new parents, so I thought in my mind. I enjoyed this goodness for about two years, 
and then the devil struck again. Chinadum and his parents were traveling to Umuahia, and their car ran into a tipper carrying laterites. Chinadum and his parents died on the spot. On hearing the news, I collapsed. My sorrow could better be imagined. I managed to survive through the burial ceremony, supplying those cooking with firewood and running errands, at the end of which I went back to my father's house and resumed the menial jobs to be able to feed. I continued doing odd jobs on the farm, in gardens, going a-fishing with elders until one day, a man from my compound hired me to work in his farm for 50K. At the farm, he subjected me to a series of questions. First, he asked me to show him my father's lands. Secondly, to hand over such lands to a man, no matter how closely related he was. In either case, I objected, and he was offended. He then vowed to kill me in the forest. I became afraid and ran and shouted for help. Unfortunately, because the area was far into the thick forest, no one came but help came from God. He pursued me with his knife, but being younger, I was too fast for him and fell into a pit of about 1.82 meters deep and was covered by the grass in it. He searched for me, and after a while he gave up. I later struggled out of the pit and through another route returned to the village. I reported the incident to the elders in the compound, but no action was taken. The common plight of orphans. This incident created real hatred in my young heart. No one loved me. No one cared. I reflected in my mind why anyone would want to kill me knowing I had no parents. Life was full of misery. Now I know that God in his love restrained the devil from suggesting suicide to me. I turned to the church and became a full member of the Assemblies of God Church in my village. I still am. But unfortunately, no one cared even when some of the members knew about me. It is important to note that I became a full member of the church without knowing Jesus Christ. I never knew what it meant to be born again. If you are in the church of Jesus Christ and find yourself in the situation I found myself, give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture says, Let him have all our worries and cares, for he is always thinking about you and watching everything that concerns you. 1 Peter 5, 7, Living New Testament In the midst of all these hardships and suffering, Alice appeared. Alice was a girl I knew during my elementary school days. She was five years older and from the same village. We were in the same class, sat on the same bench, and became very friendly. With this childhood's love affair, we promised getting married when we would be old. Ridiculous. A child of eleven years then without parents? No education? No food to eat? Promising marriage to a girl of five years his senior. Alice later left for a cure for her secondary education and sent me dozens of love letters. The next time I met Alice, I was fifteen years, and she was twenty. She had finished her secondary school education and was working with the Standard Bank Lagos, now First Bank, where her parents lived. Alice, having known my background and my plight, took advantage of it. She told me to join her at Lagos and handed me her house address with 50 naira, the national currency of Nigeria. That was a fortune for a young boy of 15 years who had never earned up to 2 naira a day. This was manna from heaven, and this meant that Lagos must be a wonderful place with plenty of money and the good things of life for all to enjoy. Then I must go to Lagos to make my own money and get riches too. Going to Lagos, to my mind, was my only way of escape. Escape from my father's enemies. Escape from my enemies. Escape from hunger and all my problems. Escape! Escape! Yes, escape from all that is evil. Chapter 2. The Initiation There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 14.12 But the wicked are like the troubled sea, when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God to the wicked. Isaiah 57.20-21 And life outside Jesus Christ is exactly as stated in the above scriptures. I left my village, armed with the fifty naira and the address given to me by Alice, escaping to freedom, liberty, enjoyment, and all that go with them. But as you will see later, it was far from what I had conceived in my young heart. When I arrived in Lagos, it was so beautiful in my eyes, and I compared it with heaven, whatever heaven is like. I saw all those tall and beautiful buildings, and on each face I could see happiness, so I thought. People appeared very busy, each one minding his or her business. I was excited and said to myself, Now I know I am free. I arrived at Akintola Road, Victoria Island, 
and was well received by Alice and her parents. The parents knew me and my background as we came from the same village, but never knew of my relationship with their daughter. Alice then introduced me to them as a man she has chosen to marry. The parents were shocked, but after some discussions with her, agreed on the condition that they would further my education. Alice rejected their offer and requested that I be allowed to live with her in her own flat. The parents could not accept this, but she insisted. They had a strong argument for four days, and under some unexplained influence, they agreed, and I moved in with Alice. Alice, a very beautiful girl, told me that she was an accountant with the Standard Bank, and that she would make me rich and give me all that I needed in this life, and said, Just settle down and enjoy yourself. My first impression about Lagos was true after all. Few months ago I was in a small hut in a small village, surrounded by hatred, starvation, and suffering, and here I am, living in a big city, in a well-furnished flat, with a beautiful wife who had promised to give me all that life could offer. She showered me with gifts, money, clothing, love. I never knew that the world was filled with these good things. The devil indeed is a deceiver. The scripture rightly says, The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Only the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, can give life and give it more abundantly. John 10.10 10. Dear reader, the devil has no free gift. Whatever he gives you is for an exchange with your soul. This state of euphoria was short-lived because after a period of three months, strange things started happening. The Mysterious Experiences One night, I woke up in the dead of the night and found a boa constrictor beside me. I wanted to shout but could not. Some nights, I would wake up to see Alice's body as transparent as a cellophane bag. Some nights, she would disappear and reappear. Some nights, I would hear strange noises or dancing in the living room. I could no longer bear these fearful happenings, so I decided to ask her, and the first reaction was violence and serious warning. She said, Do not ask me this question again, or else I will deal with you. From then, I knew my life was in danger. I then preferred the sufferings in the village to what I came to discover. I became afraid of her. Two days passed, and she came with smiles, gifts, and hugged me. She told me how much she loved and cared for me, and encouraged me not to be afraid, and promised to explain things to me later. She took me to a nightclub, and there reminded me of her promise to make me rich, and told me, One day, you will know all that I know. We came back, and life continued as normal between us. Inwardly, I knew I was in danger. But how could I escape, and where would I escape to? It is important to note here that Alice's parents did not know that their daughter, though young, was involved seriously in occultism and spiritualism, and she seriously warned me never to tell them if I loved my life. Dear reader, can you imagine a twenty-year-old girl doing all these things? The outside world saw her as a very beautiful and harmless girl working with a big bank, but she was the devil's agent. There are a lot of Alices in the world today, as you will find out later in this book. A HORRIFIC DISCOVERY One day, after she had left for work, I decided to search the flat. As young as she was, the flat was well furnished. She had four refrigerators, and on opening one I saw human skulls, different parts of human body, both fresh and dry. Inside the ceiling were skeletons. In another corner of one of the rooms, I saw what I later knew as a chamber, a water pot filled with blood and a small tree in the center of the pot, a calabash, and a red cloth by it. I could not continue. Now I knew that I was a dead man, and since I had nowhere to run to, I surrendered my life to whatever comes, life or death, and kept sealed lips. Alice came back from work, and from the way she looked at me, I knew that right in her office she knew what I did in the house. Encounter with the Occult World the following day she requested me to follow her to a meeting. I was already a captive and had no choice. We went to a very big building on the outskirts of Lagos. On arriving, the building had an underground conference hall. I was instructed by Alice to enter backwards. I obeyed and entered with my back. She also did the same. The hall was so large with about five hundred young men and women seated in a circle, and seated above them was a man whose head could only be seen and without a body as the leader. Some of these young people were students, undergraduates, graduates, teachers, etc. Alice pressed a button on the wall and a seat came out from the ground, and I sat. She did the same, 
and another came out for her, and she sat. She introduced me to the congregation as a new member, and they applauded and welcomed me. Alice was promoted as a result of this. All that they discussed in the meeting I never understood. At the end of it, and as we were about to leave, I was asked to come back alone the following day by the leader. This was my first encounter with the occult world. That same night at 2 a.m., and this is the usual hour of meetings and dangerous operations by all the forces of darkness and their agents, Alice woke me up and revealed certain things to me. She said, I am not an ordinary human being. I am half human and half spirit, but mainly of the spirit. What you see in my chamber is what I use during my prayers every morning, so that the spirits will guide me through the day. As for the skeletons, I will tell you later. I never said a word. She brought out some books on world mysteries for me to read, and with my inquisitive mind, I decided to read them. Shortly I became interested, and immediately she saw that I was now interested. Unknown to me, she sent my name to an occult society in India. As previously instructed, the following day I went back to the society alone, and there met nine others and some witnesses. We were to be initiated. We were called out to the center of the hall, and the following things were administered to us. Number one, a concoction that looked like putty was rubbed on our bodies. This qualifies you as a full member. Number two, a glass shot of oil-like liquid was given to us to drink. This qualifies you to be an agent. Number three, a gunpowder-like substance was rubbed on our heads. This qualifies you to study their mysteries. Unknown also to me, this initiation ceremony was being recorded in India, and the next day I received a letter from them. In the letter, I was instructed to stain the letter with my own blood and to post it back to them through a means they described, not the post office. I did. From this point, there was no turning back. Turning back meant death, as one was always reminded, and I knew there was no more hope for me. Covenant with Alice Early one morning, she told me there was an important ceremony to be performed in the house. At 2 a.m., she brought a crawling child, a girl, alive. Before my eyes, Alice used her fingers and plucked out the child's eyes. The cry of that child broke my heart. She then slaughtered the child into pieces and poured both the blood and the flesh into a tray and asked me to eat. I refused. She looked straight at me, and what came out of her eyes cannot be explained in writing. Before I knew what was happening, I was not only chewing the meat, but also licking the blood. While this was happening, she said, This is a covenant between us. You will never say out anything you see me do, or anything about me to any human on earth. The day you break this covenant, your own is gone, meaning that the day I break this covenant, I will be killed. After this incident, I started having strange feelings inside me. I was changed and could no longer control myself. A word of warning to mothers. Do you know your house helps? What is his or her background like? Do you care to find out all about him or her before entrusting the lives of your children to him or her? How did Alice get the little child she slaughtered, you may ask? Therefore, parents, know the background of your house helps. When Alice saw that she had succeeded in getting me fully involved in spiritism and was fast growing in it, she was satisfied and knew her mission was accomplished. She found a flat for me, helped furnish it, and thereafter severed the relationship. Covenant in India The Society in Delhi, India, sent me a second letter asking me to come over to India. In it also I was instructed to do the following. Eat excreta, eat decaying smelling rats, and to have sexual intercourse with spirits in the cemetery at night. After fulfilling the above, I was bound never to have any sexual intercourse with any women on earth. I sent a reply to their letter informing them that I had no visa Neither do I know how to get to India. At this time, I had started doing business. I was a serious smuggler, but because of these powers behind me, I had no trouble with customs, etc. I started having a lot of money, food and materials were no longer scarce. One day, I locked my flat and went out. Coming back, I opened the door and behold, a man sitting in the parlor. I was afraid. He said, Are you not Emmanuel Amos? I said, I am. He said, I have been sent to come and collect you to India, so get ready. I locked everywhere, went and sat beside him on the cushion ready for the next order. 
but like lightning he touched me and we vanished. The next place I saw myself was in a big conference hall in Delhi, India, with a large congregation already seated and waiting to welcome us. They brought out files where my name had already been written and asked me to sign beside it. I did. A tray containing human flesh cut in pieces with a basin of blood were brought. An empty jug was given to each person. Then a man without a head went round pouring the blood and flesh into the jugs. Different candles and incenses were being burnt also. The headless man made some incantations, and everyone drank the blood and ate the meat, and the meeting was over. THE INITIATIONS IN INDIA Now the period of my testing had come. I was sent to a valley about two hundred meters deep. In it were assorted dangerous reptiles and wild beasts. These were to torture me. I was not to shout, for if I did, I have failed the exam, and the consequence was death. After seven days of agony, I was brought out and sent to a place called India Jungle. In this jungle, I saw different types of demonic birds, demonic because some had faces like dogs, some like cats, etc., yet with wings. Inside this jungle was a cave, and this cave is only opened by these demonic birds. They opened the cave and I went inside. The things I saw are hard to explain. There were terrible creatures. Some looked like human beings but with tails and without human faces. This was another place of torture. The torture there could best be described as semi-hell. I was in that state for seven days and was brought out. I was then sent to a very big library that contained large volumes of mystic books to study. I later picked out two books, Abyssinia, which means destruction, and Asinna, which means giving life or curing. Later I was given more books. I was instructed to build a chamber as soon as I returned to Nigeria with the following things in it. A native water pot filled with human blood, a living tree inside, a human skull, vulture feathers, wild animal skins, boa skin, and a big shiny laterites beside the pot. The blood inside the water pot is to be taken every morning with an incantation. I was also instructed never to eat any food cooked by humans, but that I would be fed supernaturally. With all these instructions, I came back to Nigeria the same way I went, and fulfilled all. Back Home in Nigeria I had now become a part and parcel of the spirit world, and could travel at will to any part of the world. According to the books I brought, spirit beings are living in space. Perhaps they would increase my powers. So I decided to try. I came out of my house, made some incantations, and called the whirlwind and disappeared. I found myself in space and saw these spirit beings. What do you want? they asked. I told them I wanted powers. I came back to earth after two weeks, having acquired powers from them. Like I said earlier, I no longer could control myself. Despite all these powers I had already received, I still needed more and more powers. I then decided to go into Underworld to prove what was written in the books given to me. One day I went to a hidden place in the bush, made some incantations as stated in the books, and commanded the ground to open. The ground opened, and the demons created steps immediately. I stepped in and went right inside the ground. There was total darkness that can only be compared with one of the plagues that occurred in Egypt, as recorded in the Bible. I saw a lot of things that are hard to explain. I saw people chained, people used for making money. Their duties are to work day and night to supply money to their captors. I saw some elite society members who came in to do some sacrifices and would go back to the world with some gifts given to them by the spirits controlling the place. I saw some church leaders who came for powers, powers to say a thing that is accepted without questioning in the church. I stayed for two weeks and came back after receiving more powers. People saw me as young and innocent, but never knew I was dangerous. There are lots of such people around. Only those in Christ Jesus are safe in the real sense of safety. Covenant with the Queen of the Coast One evening I decided to have a walk. Along a Butte Meta bus stop, I saw a young beautiful lady standing. I never spoke a word to her. The next day while passing also I saw her still at the same spot. The third day I saw her still at the same spot, and while passing she called me. I stopped and introduced myself to her as Emmanuel Amos, but she refused introducing herself. I asked her name and address, but she only laughed. She asked mine, and I told her the street only. When I was about to leave, she said she would visit me one day. In my mind I said that was impossible. I did not give her my house number. 
How then could she come? But true to her words, I heard a knock on my door after a week of that meeting at the bus stop. There she was, the mysterious lady. I welcomed her in my mind. I wondered who this beautiful lady was, and did she know she was treading on dangerous grounds? I entertained her, and she left. After this first visit, her visits became regular, without any relationships. I noticed that in her visits she kept to a particular time, and would not come a minute earlier or later. In some of her visits I would take her to the Lagos Bar Beach, or to the Paramount Hotel, or Ambassador Hotel. All this while she still did not tell me her name. I decided not to worry since I knew the relationship would not develop more than that. I had already been instructed never to touch a woman. Suddenly she changed the day visits to nights. During one of the visits, she told me, Now it is time for you to visit me. We stayed together that night, and at 8 a.m. the following day we took off. We joined a bus, and she told the driver to stop at the bar beach. As we stopped, I asked her, Where are we going? She said, Don't worry, you are going to know my house. She took me to a corner of the bar beach, used something like a belt, and tied around us, and immediately a force came from behind and pushed us into the sea. We started flying on the surface of the water and straight to the ocean. Dear reader, these happened in my physical form. At a point, we sank into the seabed, and to my surprise, I saw us walking along an expressway. We moved into a city with a lot of people, all very busy. The Spirit World I saw laboratories like science labs, designing labs, and a theater. At the back of the city, I saw young beautiful girls and handsome young men. No old people. She introduced me to them, and I was welcomed. She took me to places like the dark room, the drying room, and the packing room. She then took me to a main factory and warehouse, and then came to her private mansion. There she sat me and told me, I am the queen of the coast, and would like very much to work with you. I promise to give you wealth, and all that goes with it protection, and all that goes with it, life, and an angel to guide you. She pressed a button, and a tray came out with human flesh, in pieces in it, and we ate together. She commanded a boa to appear, and asked me to swallow it. I could not. She insisted, but I could not. How could I swallow a live boa? She then used her powers, and I swallowed it. These were three covenants. The human flesh and blood, the boa, and the demonic angel were always there to make sure no secret was revealed. But the angel was given power to discipline me if I went astray, and also to bring me food from the sea any time I was here on earth. I promised to obey her always. After this promise, she took me to another part of the ocean, this time an island. There were trees, and each of these trees had different duties. There was a tree for poisoning, a tree for killing, a tree for invoking, and a tree for a cure. She gave me powers to change to all kinds of sea animals, like hippopotamus, boa constrictor, and crocodile, and then she vanished. I stayed in the sea for a week, and through one of the means, as a crocodile, mentioned above, I came back to the world. The Underworld Laboratories I stayed in Lagos for a week, and went back to the sea, this time for two months. I went into the scientific laboratories to see what was happening. I saw psychiatrists and scientists all working very seriously. The work of these scientists is to design beautiful things like flashy cars, the latest weapons, and to know the mystery of this world. If it were possible to know the pillar of the world, they could have, but thank God, only God knows. I moved into the designing room, and there I saw many samples of cloth, perfumes, and assorted types of cosmetic. All these things, according to Lucifer, are to distract men's attention from the Almighty God. I also saw different designs of electronics, computers, and alarms. There was also a TV from where they knew those who are born-again Christians in the world. There you see and differentiate those who are churchgoers and those who are real Christians. I then moved from the laboratories to the dark room and the drying room. The dark room is where they kill any disobedient member. They kill by first draining the person's blood, and then they send the person to the machine room where he or she will be ground to powder, and then they send the dust to the sack room where they will be bagged and kept for the native doctors to collect for their charms. There were more things which are hard to explain in writing. Despite all these powers in me, I was not yet qualified to meet with Lucifer, but only qualified to be his agent. All the same, I was satisfied that I now had powers and could face, 
challenge, and destroy things at will. Could there be any other powers anywhere I mused within my mind? Chapter 3 The Wicked Reign The thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. John 10, 10. On returning to Lagos, I continued in my business, and after two weeks I went back to the sea. The queen of the coast gave me what she called her first assignment. I should go to my village and kill my uncle, a prominent powerful native doctor who was responsible, according to her, for the death of my parents. I obeyed and went, but having not killed before, I hadn't the courage to kill him. Rather, I destroyed his medicines and rendered him powerless. As a result of this act, he lost all his customers till this date. I came back to give a report assignment, but she was wrathful with me. She said the consequence of disobeying her instructions was death, but because of her love for me, she would send me back to the same village to kill two elders who she said gave a helping hand in the killing of my parents. Whether this was a punishment for disobeying her or not, I did not know. However, I obeyed and went back to the village and managed to kill these men and sent their blood to her. As a result of the mysterious circumstances of their death, the elders in the village went to inquire from another powerful native doctor who normally sent lightning to investigate the killer. Unfortunately for these men, I met the native doctor in spirit, where he was consulting with spirits, and warned him not to say anything if he loved his life. He came out and told the elders to go home and beg one of their sons whom they had offended and never mentioned my name. The lightning he sent returned and struck in their midst, killing some and leaving many wounded. After this first act, the powers in me started manifesting themselves. I would deform a girl for refusing me friendship, etc. My Meeting with Satan I later went back to Lagos. One day, a girl named Nina came to me. Nina, whose parents were from a Nambra state, was a very beautiful young girl, but lives mostly in the sea, i.e. the underwater spirit world. She was an ardent agent of the Queen of the Coast, and very wicked. She hated the Christians to the core, and would go all lengths to fight Christianity. I first met her during my visit to the sea. Nina came for an errand from the Queen of the Coast. We left immediately, and reaching there I learnt of our having a conference with Lucifer. Satan, in this meeting, gave us the following instructions. To fight the believers, and not the unbelievers, because the unbelievers were already his. When he said this, one of us asked, Why? He said the reason was that God drove him out of that place. He refused to call the word heaven, and all throughout our meetings with him he never mentioned the word heaven. Rather, he would always use the word, that place, because of pride, and therefore he does not want any Christian to get there, heaven. He also told us that we should not fight the hypocrites. They are like me, he said. He continued his speech and said, we should only fight the real Christians. That his time was near, therefore we should fight as never before, and make sure no one enters that place. So one of us said to him, we heard that God has sent someone to rescue mankind back to God. Satan then asked, who is that? One member answered, Jesus. And to our greatest surprise, Lucifer fell from his seat. He shouted at the man and warned him never to mention that name in any of our meetings if he loves his life. It is true that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow. Philippians 2, 10, including Satan. After this incident, he encouraged us and told us not to mind these Christians, that he, Lucifer, would soon come to rule the world and would give us, his agents, a better place so that we would not suffer with the rest of the world, and he would make us rulers. He continued that since man likes flashy and fanciful things, he would continue to manufacture these things and make sure that man has no time for his God, and that he would use the following to destroy the church. Number one, money. Number two, wealth. Number three, women. At the end of this speech, he dismissed the meeting. This was my first meeting with Satan. Several others followed after this meeting. As we were leaving, the queen of the coast, who now appears in different forms, invited me to her mansion. She inserted human ashes with other things inside the bones of my two legs, a stone, not an ordinary stone, in my finger, and something else inside the bone of my right hand. Each of these things had their duties. The stone in my finger was to know the thought of anyone against me. The one in my right hand was to empower me to destroy, and the ones in the legs are to make me more hardened and to become more dangerous, and also to enable me to change to a woman, a beast, a bird, a cat, etc. She took me to one of the laboratories and gave me a telescope, a TV, and a video. 
These were not ordinary things, but were to be used in detecting the born-again Christians and the churchgoers inside the church. Finally, she gave me sixteen girls to work as my agents. Nina was one of them. I came back to Lagos, armed with the above-mentioned gifts, transformed into Satan's agent. I had no human feelings, nor mercy in my heart any longer. I went into operation immediately, and destroyed five duplexes at a go. They all sunk inside the ground with their inhabitants. This happened at Lagos in August 1982. The contractor was held responsible for not laying a good foundation, and paid dearly for it. A lot of destruction happening in the world today is not man-made. The devil's duty is to steal, kill, and destroy. I say it again, Satan has no free gift. I went into causing accidents on the roads, etc. A case I would like to mention is about a young convert who went about testifying of his salvation and deliverance. He was causing a lot of harm in the spirit world for doing this, so I planned an accident for him. One day he was on a luxurious bus to Lagos. He had an appointment where he was to give his testimony. As the bus was on high speed, I wheeled it out of the road, and it went and crashed onto a tree. All the passengers died except this young convert. His escape was miraculous, because he came out of the vehicle through the boot of the bus and shouted, I am safe, I am safe. We tried to stop him from testifying, but we failed. Through the TV, we would know a man who repented newly and would pursue him seriously to see if we could make him backslide. If, after six months, we do not succeed, we would go into his business and make it go bankrupt. If he or she is a civil servant, we would oppress him or her through the boss and, if possible, make the boss terminate his or her appointment. If, after all these, he refuses to backslide, then we would give him up. But if he backslides, he would be killed to make sure he does not have a second chance to repent. I destroyed lives to the extent that Lucifer became very pleased and made me chairman of the wizards. A month after my chairmanship, a meeting was called. We attended that meeting as birds, cats, and snakes. These creatures are used for the following reasons. Number one, turning to birds makes wizards more dangerous. Number two, turning to cats makes wizards able to reach both spirits and humans. Number three, turning to rats enables wizards to enter into a house easily, then in the night turn to shadow, and then to a human being and suck the victim's blood. In this meeting we had only one item on the agenda, the Christians. We then scheduled to hold an African wizard conference in Benin City in 1983. We published it in all the dailies and all the public media. All the forces of darkness were mobilized, and we were very confident that nothing was going to interrupt this meeting. In fact, everything was well planned, and there was no loophole. Suddenly, the Christians in Nigeria went into prayers and praises unto their God, and all our plans were shattered. Not only that our plans were shattered, but also there was real confusion in the kingdom of darkness. As a result, the Witches and Wizards Conference could not be held in Nigeria. Christians should note that the moment they go into real praises to God Almighty, there would be trouble and confusion both in the sea and in the air, and the agents of Satan would have no resting place. Prayer is like throwing a time bomb in our midst, and everyone would escape for his or her life. If Christians would realize and use the power and authority God has given them, they would control the affairs of their nation. Only Christians can save our nation. After the failure of this conference, which was later held in South Africa, I was called back to the sea. When I arrived, I was told from that moment I would make the sea my home and only visit the world for difficult operations. I was given a new assignment, inventing charms for native doctors, in charge of the controlling room, and sending the gifts, i.e. opening of white garment churches or prayer houses, opening of maternities, opening stores, and making them prosper, and giving children and money. These will be explained one after the other. Number 1. Opening of White Garment Churches When a man comes to us for an assistance to build a prayer house and help him perform healings, etc., he would be given some conditions. A. He will agree to donate to us one or two souls every year. B. At a certain level of office in the church, the person would be initiated to our society. C. No member would be allowed to come into the prayer house with shoes on. When he accepts these conditions, he would be given something like white gravel, human bones, blood and charms, all in a native pot. He would be instructed to bury this pot with all its content in front of the church and bury the cross on its top. 
After the burial, only the cross should be seen. He would be advised to build a pool or keep a basin where spirits would continue to supply special water. This water is what you hear them call holy water. Many people, when disturbed by evil spirits, go to these prophets to cast them out. The truth is, they only add more demons to them. A devil cannot cast out a devil. What the prophet would do is, he will pray for the member and then give him or her a red cloth to put in his or her house, and then would advise him or her to always pray with candles and incenses. By this act, the person invites us into his or her house. Sometimes the member would be advised to bring a goat, etc., for sacrifice. These sacrifices are for us to come and help cure the man. The prophet has no power to cure or heal. Number 2. Opening of Maternities If a woman comes to us for assistance in opening a maternity and making it prosper, she would be given this condition. A month would be chosen by us in which all the children born in the maternity would die, but the other months the children would live. If she accepts, she would also be given a charm which would attract people into the maternity. There are such maternities in Onitsha, Lagos, etc. Shoes are not allowed into such maternities. Number 3. Opening of Fancy Stores When a man approaches us for assistance in this respect, he would be given a ring with the condition that no woman would be allowed to touch it. He also must agree to be our member. If he accepts to fulfill these conditions, his store would be stocked always with the best and latest materials by us. Number 4. Giving of Children If a barren woman goes to some native doctors after laying her complaints, she would be asked to bring the following, a white cock, a goat, native chalk, and baby care. She would be advised to go, and in her absence the native doctor will come to us bringing these things. We would then mix certain things which are difficult to explain in writing, and include human ashes. He would use this charm to cook food for the woman. She would become pregnant and give birth, but it's not a normal human being. If the child is a female, she would live and even get married, but would remain barren all her life. If the child is a male, he will live and even be trained, only to die suddenly. They never live to bury their parents. I would like to mention here that barrenness is mostly caused by demons. You may see a woman barren here on earth, but she would have children in the sea. I therefore advise God's children to wait on God alone, because only God gives real children. Number 5. Giving of Money If a man comes to us for money, he would be given these conditions to fulfill. He will be asked to give a part of his body, or if he has a family, he would be asked to bring his son. If single, he would be asked to bring his elder or younger brother. Whoever he decides to bring must be from the same womb. Something worth mentioning is, during the killing of the victim, the person who brought him would be given a spear or an arrow. His relations would be made to file past in a mirror. As soon as the one he had donated passes, he would be asked to strike, and as this happens, the victim would die where he is. There are other methods, but one thing Satan does is this. He makes sure that in the different methods, the donor becomes responsible for the death of the victim by making the donor strike the victim. Remember, Satan has no free gift. Chapter 4. How Satan Fights Christians For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians 6, 10-12 Fighting Christians After the command by Lucifer to fight the Christians, we then sat and mapped out ways of fighting them as follows. Number 1. Causing sickness. Number 2. Causing barrenness. Number 3. Causing slumber in the church. Number 4. Causing confusion in the church. Number 5. Causing lukewarmness in the church. Number 6. Making them ignorant of the Word of God. Number 7. By fashion and emulation. Number 8. Fighting them physically. Amongst the above, I would like to explain two. Number 1. Fighting physically. With the TV given to me, I would see the born again Christians. We do not fight hypocrites because they belong to us already. We would then send our girls first to the big churches. Inside the church, they would be chewing gum or making a child cry or do anything that would distract the people from hearing the word of God. They may decide to come spiritually and cause the people to sleep while the preaching is going on. The moment they see you have a sober reflection because of the preaching, they would wait on you outside the church, and as you come out, 
one of them would greet you and even present you a gift, and it's always what you love, and would appear very friendly. She would do everything, and before you knew what was happening, you had forgotten all you learned in the church. But for a real Christian, one of these girls, after the service, would jump out to greet you and would desire to know your house with the pretext that she was new in town and did not know many Christians around. On taking her home, she would quickly buy bananas, and the Christian would take this as a gesture of love. She would continue her visits until she finally puts off the light of Christ in you, and then stops coming. Major operations in the living churches and fellowships are discouraging the Christians from reading and studying the Word of God, and thereby making them ignorant of their authority and of the promises of God. In crusade grounds, these girls would be sent to cause disagreements and quarrels. How Christians are known the born-again Christians are not known by the Bible they carry always, or the many fellowships they attend. They are known in the spirit world by the light that shines continuously like a very bright candle in the heart, or a circle of light around the head, or a wall of fire around them. When a Christian is walking along, we see angels walking along with him or her, one by the right, one by the left, and one behind. This makes it impossible for us to come near him or her. The only way we succeed is by making the Christian sin thereby giving us a loophole to come in. When a Christian is driving a car and we want to harm him or her, we find that he or she is never alone in the car. There is always an angel by him or her. Oh, if the Christian only knows all that God has for him, he will not meddle with sin or live carelessly. Number 2. The Making of Backslidden Christians As a chairman appointed by Lucifer, I would send these girls to living churches and fellowships. These girls would be well-dressed, and after the preaching would come out for the altar call, pretend to have received Christ, and would be prayed for. At the end of the fellowship or service, they would hang around waiting for the preacher, who naturally would be very happy for these new converts. The converts may even follow the preacher to his house. If the preacher does not have the spirit of discernment, she would lure him into the sin of fornication or adultery. This takes place the moment he admires her lustfully. She would make sure he continued in this sin, until she finally quenches the Spirit of God in him, and then leave him, mission accomplished. At this juncture, I would like to give a testimony of a minister. In the evil spirit world, he is known as a man of God. When he went on his knees, there would be confusion among us. We therefore sent these girls to him. The man would even feed them, but would refuse to be enticed. They did all they could, but never succeeded. As a result, these girls were killed for their failure. I then changed into a woman and went to him, and by words and actions tried to entice him, but he was adamant. This was too much for me, so I decided to kill him physically. One day, this minister went to Odewekpe Road, Market Town. I watched him as he bent down to price some commodities. I wheeled an oncoming trailer loaded with drums of oil into the market where he was. The trailer struck the Nepa high tension pole and fell right into the market, leaving many people dead. But this minister escaped. How he escaped was a miracle. Another day I saw him traveling to the town of Nikpur on foot. I again willed an oncoming army lorry loaded with yams to kill him. The lorry went straight into the new cemetery road, killed many people. But this minister again escaped. After this second attempt we gave up. He is still alive. Because of a single Christian, the devil may decide to destroy many souls, thinking he could kill him, but he always fails. These incidents had happened to many Christians unknown to them, but their God always delivered them. The trouble is, the devil does not give up. His thoughts are always, I may succeed. But he never does. As long as the Christian walks with God's love and remains in him and does not get entangled with the affairs of this life, the devil can never succeed, no matter how hard he tries. Only the unbeliever is at his disposal. The Oppression of the Christian this mostly happens in dreams. A Christian may see, in his or her dreams, the following. Number one, a dead relation visiting him or her. Number two, masquerades pursuing him or her. Number three, mates swimming in the river. Number four, mates bringing food and asking him or her to eat. Number five, a single female having sexual intercourse or even a married one having sex with a man. This, if not dealt with, sometimes leads to barrenness. Or a pregnant woman sees herself having sexual intercourse with a man. This, if not immediately dealt with, could lead to a miscarriage. If a Christian experiences the above in his or her dreams, 
he or she should not put it aside by the wave of the hand, but on getting out of sleep, he or she should examine himself or herself and confess any known sin unto God, bind all those demons, and ask God to restore whatever had been tempered with. This is very important. The person should also seek the help and counsel of a mature, spirit-filled Christian, older in the faith. The Devil's Soul Winning When Jesus Christ was leaving this earth, he gave his disciples a command, Go ye into all the world, and make disciples of all nations. While some Christians are still waiting for a more suitable and convenient time to obey this command, the devil has also given this command to his agents. The difference is, the devil's agents are more serious in winning souls than the Christians. One of the areas of the devil's soul winning is the secondary schools, especially girls' schools. Some of our girls are sent into the schools as students. We supply them with all the latest and expensive underwear. This is first priority, because in girls' hostels, they like using underwear only. Our agent would never lack anything, cosmetics, dresses, underwear, books, provisions, and money. A particular bathing soap would be given to her to lend to any student who requests for soap from her. A girl desiring to be like her would be attracted and would befriend her. Gradually, our agent would introduce us to her. At this point, we would visit her physically and would start giving her gifts and meeting her needs. With this, she would join us willingly. She, in turn, would win another, and so on. This is taken as a mission, and it is carried out with a determination to succeed. One thing should be made clear. Satan does not force anyone. What he does is to attract and make you come to him willingly. That is why the Bible says, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. James 4, 7 Another area of soul winning for the devil is giving lifts. We would send our girls to stand on the road, and usually they are very beautiful and attractively dressed. You will also find them in hotels, and through these avenues we get men and women. Many people we see advertised in the papers as missing got lost through giving lifts to girls they did not know. You should therefore be careful who you lift in your car. Chapter 5 My Encounter with Jesus Christ In the month of February 1985, we had our normal meeting in the sea, after which I decided to travel to Port Harcourt in River State to visit my late uncle's wife. I met a man called Anthony. He has a workshop at Nawaja Junction along Transamati Road, Port Harcourt, River State. He sent for me, and since in our society we have a law never to refuse calls, I decided to answer his call. I went to him in the afternoon on a Thursday of that week. He started by saying God has given him a message for me. He brought out his Bible and started preaching. There were three other Christians seated, a male and two females. He continued his preaching for a long time, and I wasn't sure I heard all he said. He asked me to kneel down for prayers. I obeyed and quietly knelt down. Immediately he started his prayers. I was knocked down by the Spirit of God, and I fell flat. I struggled up and stood like an iron. I destroyed the iron chairs inside the workshop. I looked outside and saw three of our secret society members, a man and two girls. They came in human form and moved towards the door, but because of the power of God, they could not enter. I am sure the alarm in the sea alerted them of the trouble, and with the TV they knew where the problem was and had sent the powerless rescue team. This always happens when any member runs into trouble. While the two Christian men pulled me down on my knees, the girls continued praying and binding the demons, but they were not specific. They asked me if I believed in Jesus Christ. I said nothing. They asked me to call the name of Jesus. I refused. They asked me my own name, and I told them. They struggled for hours, and released me to go. No spirit was removed from me, so I went out the same way as when I came in. The Church Events The following day being Friday, I was invited by the same Anthony to attend their night vigil at the Assemblies of God Church, Silver Valley, Port Harcourt. I accepted this invitation because attending church services to cause slumber and confusion was part of our assignments. The program started with choruses. We sang until one of the members raised a popular chorus by a particular Christian band of the powerlessness of other powers, except Jesus' power. Then I started laughing. I laughed because when in the Spirit I looked into their lives, almost three-quarters of the people singing this chorus were living in sin. I knew that because of the sins in their lives, they were exposed and could be harmed seriously by these powers. 
It is important that Christians obey the word of God and not allow besetting sins to remain in their lives. In that service, we were four from the sea and were singing and clapping with them. Again, I want to stress here that when a service is started, members should be advised first to confess their sins, then go into a period of real praises to God. This will make an agent of Satan present very uncomfortable and in fact escape for his or her life. In this particular service, we were very comfortable and even went into operation. Many started sleeping. Choruses were sung weekly, and things went zigzag. Brother Anthony had already told them about me, so at about 2 a.m. they called me out to pray for me. As soon as I came out to the front, they started pleading the blood of Jesus. I stopped them and said, It is not pleading the blood that is the solution. I am a deep, secret society member. If you agree that you can deliver me, then will I kneel down. These words I spoke were not premeditated. The blood of Jesus scares the demons and protects the believer, but does not bind demons. Binding of demons only takes place when the Christian uses his authority and gives the command. They agreed, and I knelt down. At that point, a sister, led by the Spirit of God, shouted and said, If you are not worthy, do not come near. I am sure many did not understand what she meant. It is dangerous for a Christian living in sin to cast out demons. Many withdrew, and a few came out to pray for me. As they started with, in Jesus' name, I heard a big bang inside me and fell on the floor. Immediately, the flying demon in me went into action. I started running with my chest. Anybody possessed with this flying demon is always very wicked and dangerous. The brethren never saw what was happening spiritually. I was running because of the stronger power in the room. Two opposing forces went into action, and the atmosphere changed. I suddenly stood up and became very violent. A demon went out of me and possessed a boy in their midst, and he started fighting them, trying to rescue me. The brethren never wasted time with him, rather they took him and others who were afraid to the church vestry and locked them inside. This continued till 7 a.m. I was physically exhausted and became quiet. So the brethren gathered around me again and started shouting, Name them! Who are they? I kept quiet. After waiting for a long time and I said nothing, they were deceived to believe that I was delivered. They prayed and we dismissed. I was so physically weak that I found it difficult to walk out of the church. But something happened, for as soon as I walked out of the church and crossed the road, I became very strong physically. Perhaps some of the demons that left came back. I became very angry and decided to take vengeance on the church. This people had insulted me, I said to myself, and for this insult I was going back to Lagos and get more powers with others as wicked as myself, and then come back to Port Harcourt to take vengeance on all the members of the Assembly of God, Silver Valley. En route to Lagos. On getting to my uncle's wife's house, I told them I was leaving for Lagos immediately. I refused to be persuaded to stay, and I took a taxi to Mile 3 Motor Park, where I took a taxi for Onitsha. My intention was to stop at Onitsha, see a friend, and then proceed to Lagos. At Mile 3 we took off, and on getting to Omagwe, at the International Airport Junction, I heard a voice calling me by my native name, Inkeem. I turned around to see if there was a known face in the taxi, but there was none. Who could this be? Only my late mother calls me by that name. All others, including the spirit world, knew me as Emmanuel. While I was still wondering, the voice came again, Inkeem, are you going to betray me again? I did not recognize the voice, but the voice continued asking me, Are you going to betray me again? Suddenly I had severe fever. The heat that came out of my body was so high that the other passengers felt it. One of them asked me, Mister, were you well at all before traveling? I told them I was well and that I never had even a headache before leaving Port Harcourt. At Umuakpa in Oweri, I collapsed inside the taxi. The next I knew was that two men, tall and huge, came to take me, one on my left and the other on my right, and they never spoke a word to me. They led me through a very rough road with bottles and medals. As we moved along, these bottles and medals gave cuts, and I started crying, but these men still did not say a word. We moved on and came out to an express road. It was here one of them spoke and said, You are a wanted man. And we continued. We moved on to a very large and long building that looked like a conference hall. As soon as we climbed the pavement, a voice from inside said, Take him in. 
They took me in and disappeared, leaving me alone. What I saw inside this hall is difficult to explain, but I will try to explain as much as I can. The hall was well decorated and so large and long that one finds it difficult to see the end of it. I walked to the middle and then was able to see the end. At the end was an altar. I saw a moon and stars surrounding the sun. Then I saw a throne, and seated on it was a very handsome man with a garment shining like the sun. He said, Come. But because of his brightness, I could not go. Whenever I tried to move a leg, I would fall. I stood up, tried again, and fell. Suddenly a moon came out of the throne where he was sitting, and moved on the ceiling right up where I stood. Then two hands came out of the moon, held my head, shook me, and my physical body pulled off, like pulling off a dress. And the real me stood. The hands folded, as if folding a cloth, and dropped it at the corner. The moon then moved back to the throne, and then he that sat on it said again, Come. The Spiritual Cleansing I walked to a point, and he stepped out of the throne to me, removed my legs one after another, and poured out what was inside them and fixed them back. He did the same with my hands and put them back. In fact, all the places the queen of the coast kept powers. I wondered in my mind, who can this be? And how did he know the spots these things were kept? After this, he went back to his throne and asked me to come. As I started walking, certain objects started falling from my body. Scales fell from my eyes. But before I got to the altar, it stopped. Where are you going? he asked. I answered and said, I am going to Onitsha to see a friend. He said, Yes, but I will show you what you have in your mind. Up till this moment I did not know who he was, but one thing was certain, and that was he was more powerful than all the powers I had come across. He beckoned on a man and asked him to show me what I had conceived in my heart. This man took me to a room and opened something like a blackboard. In fact, if there was a way to escape, I could have escaped. For before me was written all that I had planned against Christians, and my plan against the assemblies of God Church, Silver Valley. The man brought me back to the altar and left. He came out of the throne and took me by his hands and said he was going to show me certain things. On our way, he said, I do not want you to perish, but to save you, and this is your last chance. If you do not repent and come and serve me, you will die. I will show you the abode of the saved and the disobedient. When he said this, I then knew he was Jesus Christ. The Divine Revelations We entered a room, and he opened something like a curtain. I saw the whole world, the people, and all the activities going on. I saw both Christians and unbelievers, all doing one thing or the other. We went into a second room. He opened a curtain again, and what I saw was a sorry sight. People chained! He called these people the hypocrites. These people looked very sorrowful, and he said, They will remain this way until the judgment day. We went into a third room. He opened a curtain, and I saw many people rejoicing and wearing white garments. This time I asked him, Who are these? He said, These are the redeemed, awaiting their rewards. We went into a fourth room, and what I saw was very frightening. Dear reader, it is difficult to describe. It looked like a whole city on fire. Hell is real and terrible. If you had been made to believe that heaven and hell are here on earth, and that man has no hereafter but total annihilation after death, you better be well advised here and now that there is a real hell and there is a real heaven. No wonder when Jesus Christ was on earth he warned man about hell. I say it again, hell is real. I saw it, and it is a terrible place. I asked him, what is it? His answer was, This is prepared for Satan and his angels, and for the disobedient. He named them as recorded in Revelation 21.8. But the fearful, and unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We went into a fifth room, and when he opened a curtain, what I saw can only be described as glorious. It was as if we were looking at it from a mountaintop. I saw a new city. The city was so large and beautiful. The streets are made of gold. 
The buildings could not be compared with anything in this world. He said, This is the hope of the saints. Will you be there? Immediately I answered, Yes. After this we went back to the throne and he said, Go and testify what I have done for you. Again he took me to another room, and when he opened a curtain I saw all that I was going to encounter on my journey to Onitsha and Lagos, and how he would finally deliver me. After this he said to me, Do not be afraid. Go. I will be with you. He led me out of the hall and vanished, and I woke up on a bed in another man's house. I shouted, so the man and his wife ran out from their room. They first peeped and then came in. Why am I here? I asked. The man then narrated how I collapsed in the taxi, and how they carried me to the Catholic cathedral there in Oweri, how they sent for a doctor, who came, and after examining me, said my pulse was normal, and that they should wait and see what would happen. The doctor gave them the assurance that I would revive. The man then took me in his car to his house, and had been waiting. He also confessed he never knew why he believed the doctor, and why he took responsibility of taking me to his house. They asked me my name and address, which I gave them, and after that I kept quiet and never told them my experience. I stayed calmly with this kind family for two days, and then the man and his wife drove me to the Oweri Motor Park, where I took a taxi to Onitsha. All that the Lord showed me about my journey happened one after the other. I took another taxi to Lagos first thing the following morning. I obeyed and left Lagos for Port Harcourt the following morning. I often asked myself, why would the Lord save a man like me, a man so wicked and destructive, an agent of Satan? I found the answer in these three words. God is love. Indeed, God is love. Chapter 6 Temptation and Victory My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. John 10, 27-28 After my conversion to Christ, the first thing that happened was all the gifts from the sea, the telescope, the TV, shirts, photographs I snapped inside the sea laboratories, and the photograph of the Queen of the Coast, which were displayed in my flat, vanished. On returning to Port Harcourt, I had the urge to testify what the Lord had done for me, but was not allowed in the church. My late uncle's wife, who is also a Christian, took me to one of the pastors. But the question he asked was, Did he bring the paper? It was later that I understood that the paper he meant was a membership letter. What has a membership letter to do with my testifying the power of Christ and what he has done for me? God translating me from the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom I have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of my sins. I was sad, having known that Satan does not allow young converts to go about testifying, especially those who previously were deeply involved in his activities, and would do everything to stop such testimonies. Again I remembered, The Lord clearly instructed me to go and testify what I have done for you and here I was faced with rejection. Perhaps it was not yet time. So I decided to shelve giving my testimony to anyone. I traveled with three traders from Abba to Togo for a business trip. There I bought goods worth 160,000 naira. Out of this amount, my personal money was 70,000 naira, while the remaining 90,000 naira was borrowed from traders in Abba. Amongst the things I bought were bundles of laces, assorted drugs, especially antibiotics, injections, thermometers, etc. At the Nigerian border, we were held by the customs and later were asked to pay some bribe. We refused and the goods were seized, including those belonging to my colleagues. A few months later, those belonging to my colleagues were released, except mine. I went back later and was asked to pay 40,000 naira, but on checking the goods, I discovered that all the valuable goods, bundles of laces, injections, drugs, were already stolen. I assessed the remaining goods and knew that paying 40,000 naira to the customs would only increase the loss, so I decided to forego the remaining goods. The traders whose money I borrowed started chasing me. Some called the police. Others took the laws into their hands and planned to do away with my life. The only solution was to close my bank accounts 
and use all the money I had to settle all the debts. By God's grace, I paid all except 1,000 naira meant for my landlord in Lagos. I went completely bankrupt and would borrow even 20k for taxi fare. I went to a few business Christians I knew then to seek help to enable me to start afresh. None said yes or no. Rather, I would be asked to come the following day repeatedly until I would be tired or find help. I did not know the word of God, and with all the confusion in my heart, I would read the Bible and would not understand. Still contemplating on what to do, I received an urgent call from my village. I rushed home and found that the little building I was setting up had been pulled down by my uncle, who was also present, and threatened to kill me. The old nature in me was challenged. I remembered when I was with the secret society how he dreaded me and would go on his knees before me. But now he knew I was a changed man. How he knew I did not know as I had not traveled home since my conversion. And he now threatened me. I called on the Lord and said, So you saved me to leave me frustrated and to allow my enemies to rejoice over me? I wept and decided to go back to the society. At least I would be saved from all the confusion and would also teach my uncle a lesson he would never forget all his life. Although I took the decision, I had two prominent fears within me. Number one, during my conversion, the Lord clearly told me, This is your last chance. My going back to the society might mean death, not only physical, but also spiritual death. Number two, if I remained in the Lord, my uncle was breathing threats to kill me. I was so confused, and I needed help. I was ignorant of the word of God and never knew what the word says in respect of the above. Dear reader, you will realize here that I had all these confusions because of lack of follow-up as a young convert. Follow-up for young converts is very important, and Christians should take this seriously. If you know you cannot follow up your converts, please do not go out for witnessing. Jesus Christ emphasized this three times when he asked Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Feed my lambs. Many converts backslide because of lack of proper follow-up. If you love Jesus, take care of his lambs. The Battle with Satan's Agents During this period, the Queen of the Coast's agents started pursuing me. I suffered greatly in their hands. I had nightmares. On the 1st of May, 1985, a month after my conversion, at about 2 a.m., others in the house were asleep. I was awakened by these agents. They commanded me to walk out of the house. I obeyed, walked out, and they followed behind. It was all happening like a dream, but this was in reality. We moved on to the burial ground by St. Paul's Anglican Church, off Abba Road, Port Harcourt. On reaching there, they said, You must come back. If you refuse, we will kill you or make you a destitute. After this instruction, they left. I regained my senses and wondered how I came into the burial ground. I went back to bed and slept. They decided to attack me in the afternoons. At times, while walking along the road, they would fight me. Others around would see me fighting with the air or see me running as if being pursued. I alone would be seeing them. This they did four times and stopped. Then their leader, the Queen of the Coast, took over. The first day she came in a car and parked beside our house. She was well-dressed and, as usual, very beautiful. People around took her to be my girlfriend. Immediately she came in, and I knew who she was. She came at about twelve noon, when the whole area was less busy. She sat down and, among other things, said, You can go to your church. Believe whatever you want to believe. But if only you will not reveal me, I will give you anything you need in this life. I had not known the scriptures, so I only listened and watched her walk. She pleaded and tried to persuade me to come back to her. I never said yes or no to her. She stood up, walked into her car, and drove off. About two times my uncle's wife entertained her without knowing who she was, and I never told my uncle's wife who the lady was. During her last visit, she changed her approach. This time she gave me a stern warning, saying that she had tried during these visits to persuade me to come back to her, and that I had been very stubborn, and that this was her last visit. If I still refused to come back, she would come to me in August, and would either kill me, or disfigure me, or make me destitute. 
With this she left. I was afraid, so one day I went to the church and called out a brother. I told him my problems and my observations on some members of the church. This brother gave me the Scripture Union's office address and told me, There you will find help. Incidentally, that was the last day I saw this brother. I have never seen him anywhere in Port Harcourt up till this date. I took the address and the following day took a taxi to number 108 Bonnie Street, where the office is, and met the typist who gave me the quarterly program of activities of the Scripture Union Rumuo Masi Pilgrims Group, being the one nearest to me. She said, Come on Sunday. I was there at the Fellowship Center, St. Michael's State School, Rumuo Masi, at 2 p.m., not knowing that the fellowship starts at 3 p.m., but I met the prayer band, so I joined them. After the fellowship that day, I knew this was the right place for me. God provided me with a Christian lady whom I took as a mother, who took interest in explaining the word of God to me, and counseled me as well. The brethren became very interested in me and cared. I saw real love. The Holy Spirit began giving me understanding of the word, and my faith grew. But the queen of the coast did not show up as she threatened. Psalm 91. God's protection was fulfilled in my life. Isaiah 57, 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, said the Lord. This also was fulfilled. September 1985. I received a message that my name appeared as a distributor with the silver brand cement, Lagos, and that I was expected to report at the office on 27985. I left Port Harcourt on 26985 and arrived in Lagos in the night. The following morning, I went into the office only to be told by the personnel manager that my allocation had been assigned to someone else. He asked me to repeat the following day to see the managing director. On my way back to my flat, Passing through a path, someone came from behind and gripped me and tried to suffocate me. They held my nose and mouth together. I struggled for life, and while people passed by, none came to my rescue. But the Lord intervened. While I still struggled with the hands, I heard her shout and pushed me away, saying, Who is that person behind you? She repeated a second time and disappeared. From the voice, I knew it was a woman, but never saw who she was. I was dazed and staggered to my flat. Here again my landlord was very furious and said, Why did you run away with the money of my rent? I pleaded with him and tried to explain that presently I was not working and would pay all his money as soon as I had money. With the way he consented, I thought this matter was settled. The following day, 28 985, I went back to the office and met the managing director, who apologized for having given my allocation to another. While he was talking, a young man walked in and asked me, Are you not Emmanuel? I said, Yes, I am. He said, Yes, we have got you at last. Have you finished running? We have visited Port Harcourt several times and found that you were always with your spiritual mother. She had been a stumbling block to us, and now that you have come to Lagos, we have caught you. You can never go back to Port Harcourt. I am the one that took your allocation. I challenged him and told him, You can't do anything. The managing director was surprised at what was happening in his office. I excused myself and left for the flat. A few minutes later I heard a knock on my door, and Nina entered. She asked me if I was going back to Port Harcourt. I answered yes. She pleaded with me to come back to them, and that the jobs I was particularly trained for were still lying unaccomplished. Kotipari, in the Yoruba language. I had been trained to be in charge of the agents of demonic powers, to be in charge of the sea control room, to monitor the happenings in the world, to send and receive signals, and to mobilize forces, etc., to be next to the queen of the coast. This involved not only ceremonies, sacrifices, execution of special assignments by her, but also other things difficult to explain. With the assistance of the powers of darkness, to establish new secret societies that would appear harmless so to attract young people and more churchgoers. She said, if I accompanied her, what awaited me was double promotion and many blessings. She confessed they were responsible for my goods being seized and stolen, also that they instigated my uncle to destroy my building and to threaten my life, that if I refused following her, 
they would do more and make sure that I did not prosper, that they had decided to fight my spiritual mother. If we get her, we've got you, she said. At that, I started preaching to her. She stood up and said, They are deceiving you, and left. This took place in the evening of 28 985. Not quite fifteen minutes after she left, I heard another knock. This time there were four men. They beckoned on me to come out, and I saw myself going along with them. We walked up to about two poles, and one of them asked me, Do you know us? I said no. He continued, We have been hired by your landlord to kill you. While he was still speaking, one among them brought out a gun, and another brought out a dagger. I was defenseless and knew that they would kill me. But God, in his supernatural manner, performed a miracle that surprised both myself and themselves. The man with the gun fired at me, but there was no sound. The man with the dagger used it on my back, but it never penetrated. Rather, it sounded like using a rod on someone. They were as frightened as I was. The Spirit of God came on me, and I started preaching. Three of them ran away, but the fourth man broke down and started weeping and pleaded that I should pray for him. I did not even know what to pray at that time, but only said, Lord, please forgive, forget, and pardon him. Amen. He gave his life to Christ, so I took him to a Pentecostal church and explained what happened to the pastor. I handed him over to the pastor and left. As I walked into the house, the landlord ran out and on his knees started pleading and said, Please forgive me. I thought you decided to run away to Port Harcourt because of my money, 1,000 Naira. I forgave him, and we finally agreed that the money be paid by installments. That same night, about 2 a.m., the Lord woke me up. I did not know why I woke up, so I walked to the living room, and what I saw was a large tortoise facing me. Immediately, I remembered the Bible study we had in Port Harcourt, about the power in the word. I then spoke these words, Tortoise, since I was born, the home of the tortoise is either the bush or the sea. But for coming into my house, while windows and doors are locked, you have sinned, and for this you must die. As soon as I said this, it vanished. I went back to the room and slept. A second time again, I woke up and heard some noise in the living room. I went, and there standing before me was a horrible-looking vulture. I repeated the same words, and as soon as I said, For committing this sin you must die, it vanished also. During this Lagos trip, I saw God's goodness greatness, and faithfulness. The following morning, 29-9-85, I took a luxurious bus to Port Harcourt. Reaching Orr, the bus ran onto a tree. It got damaged, but no one was hurt. The driver pulled it out back to the road, and as he drove along, the bus started swerving from one side of the road to the other. I remembered Nina's threats, so I stood up in the bus, preached to the passengers, and concluded by saying, it is because of me that these accidents are happening. But from now on, there shall be no more accidents until we get to Port Harcourt, in Jesus' name. And I sat down. In fact, when I sat down, I wondered at what I had said. And so it was. The vehicle moved smoothly to Port Harcourt. No more accidents or breakdowns. The scripture rightly says, Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. Isaiah 54:15. They, the queen of the coast and her agents, tried. But because their gathering was not unto the Lord, but against his child, they all stumbled and fell. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of God shall lift up a standard against him. Isaiah 59:19. I give God all the glory for showing himself strong on my behalf. Chapter 7. Activities of Satan's Agents Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Ephesians 6, 11-12 This book would not be complete if the different methods of operation of these powers are not exposed. Also, it is important that the different forms in which they manifest themselves be exposed. One thing is clear, and that is, the devil would either encourage you to believe that he is a myth, or simple evil thoughts, or would make you see more of his powers and less of the powers of God. While the Bible says, 
we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The Bible also says that the weapons of the Christians against the devil and his agents are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 4-5 through Again the scriptures clearly declare, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3, 8 And Jesus, having spoilt principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them. Thou art snared with the words of thy mouth, thou art taken with the words of thy mouth. Proverbs 6, 2 say the scriptures. Therefore the child of God must be careful to confess the word of God, which God has promised he will hasten to perform. There are three confessions stated in the word of God. Number one, confession of the lordship of Christ. Number two, confession of faith in the word, in Christ, and in God the Father. Number three, confession of sin. When we hear the word confession, we easily think of sin. The dictionary definition of confession is, number one, affirming something we believe, number two, testifying to something that we know, number three, witnessing of a truth we have embraced. It is therefore to be regretted that whenever we use the word confession, some minds run to sin. The author is here encouraging the child of God to start today to confess what God has said. You who were dead in trespasses had God quickened together with Christ, and he has raised you up together and made you sit in heavenly places, far above principalities and powers, in Christ Jesus. Christians should therefore realize where they are seated. They should know that they are operating from that height, above Satan and his agents. The Lord Jesus Christ has given you all powers and authority, just as he has given you all that pertains to life and godliness. 2 Peter 1, 3 God never intended that circumstances should control his children, rather that the word of God in the mouth of the Christian should control his circumstances. God spoke in Jeremiah twenty three twenty nine, saying, Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Christians, I mean born-again Christians, should realize that when the name of Jesus is pronounced, what comes out of their mouth is fire. When a Christian stands on the authority given him by Christ and gives a command in Jesus' name, fire pours out of his mouth and any demon controlling the circumstances must obey. Jesus is alive today to see to it that every word of his comes to pass. Again, I want to highlight an important fact many Christians overlook and which Satan is using. Jesus, after Peter pointed out to him the dried fig tree cursed by the Lord, said in Matthew's account, Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith, and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things, whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. Matthew 21, 21 through 22 In Mark's account, it says, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Mark eleven twenty two through 25 Here the Lord points out to us the power of the spoken word, and also encourages the Christian to be specific in his prayers, and in exercising his authority. Some Christians ask the mountain to move, but do not tell the mountain where to go. Jesus said, If you shall say to the mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea. Let us take the case of casting out demons, for instance. Some Christians bind and cast out demons without sending them to specific destinations. This is dangerous. When you bind a demon, it is bound. If you cast it out without sending it to a specific destination, it remains within the vicinity. If the demon is only rebuked out of a man, he may later come back or enter into anyone around who is not a Christian. 
Therefore, Christians should be careful when dealing with demons. Make sure the demon is bound, cast out, and sent to a specific destination. Some Christians, while praying, would say, I arrest you demons in Jesus' name. In the spirit world, you really see demons standing erect, waiting for the next command. But if the Christian stops at that point, he has not helped the victim. Do not play around with the devil. You don't play around with your enemy. God has sent you out on a ministry of deliverance and reconciliation, reconciling men to God. Therefore, you must be careful to do a thorough work. I repeat, when you bind a demon, it is bound. When you cast it out to any destination, it is so. As long as you do not meddle with sin, but live in the will of God, whatever command you give the devil or his agents in the name of Jesus must be obeyed. God has promised to back every word of his. As we go on to the next phase, manifestation of Satan and his agents, I want you to have the following passages on your mind. Number 1. Ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Colossians 2, 10. Number 2. Behold, I give you power, authority, to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Number 3. Behold, they shall surely gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me. I want to show you in this book that these evil forces operate mainly in churches, marketplaces, graveyards, jungles, hotels, sea, and air. In the churches, we are witnesses today that there are many possessed persons in the churches. Some speak in tongues and even prophesy. Only those with the Spirit of God can discern these fellows. But we are here discussing the agents of Satan in the churches. Again, we are not discussing the secret cult members who are in the churches. Some are even leaders. We know they are there. What I am talking about is those who come in as agents of Satan. Number one, to cause quarrels and confusion in the churches. Number two, to scatter the churches. Number three, to make men and women sleep while the sermon is on. Number four, to cause distraction of various sorts when the service is on. Number five, to win souls for Satan. Since I had already said a few things on the above in chapter three, I will only give you a testimony of what happened in the recent past. Christians should abide by every word of the Lord Jesus Christ because when they disobey or compromise, they are prone to fall at the slightest attempt of Satan or his agents. Christians have been called out from darkness into God's own marvelous light. Christians have been called to total separation from the world and what it offers. Come out from among them and be ye separate, says the scripture. There was this sister, Sister J, name withheld. She was born again and was a full member of one of the living churches. She later transferred her membership to my own denomination. She partook in all the activities in the church and was very active in them, but her character at a point became suspicious. So a few of us decided to visit her at her house and to find out what was really wrong with her. While interviewing her, the spirits in her were provoked and began manifesting, and then told us she was their agent in the church. These demons were cast out of her, and deliverance was ministered to her. Sister, how come you are an agent of Satan, yet a full member of the church? we asked. What she told us was the following. It all started one day, after a Sunday service. A sister, a female believer in Christ, so she thought, came to her, and expressed her desire to be close to her because, according to this sister, she admires Sister J's Christian life. She accepted her friendship without reservations. The two went to Sister J's house, and the so-called sister brought out bananas and ground nuts, which they both ate. She stayed with Sister J for a while, and later left. Her visits became regular, and on each visit she brought gifts to Sister J. The gifts ranged from dresses, shoes, money, etc. On some occasions, Sister J's friend would come with many other girls. This continued for a period, 
and when the sister saw that she had succeeded in putting out the light of Christ in Sister J, she changed and started visiting Sister J in the spirit. Sister J was then given a red cloth, a water stone, a ring for her right toe, and a chain for her ankle. Because she had eaten so much with them and had taken so much from them, there was no chance of turning back. She entered into covenant with them and started attending their meetings. She could change into a snake, a bat, etc. She then became their agent to win souls for them in the church. Praise God she is now delivered. All the gifts given her were destroyed, and she is now happy again in the Lord. Dear reader, it all started with an unusual friendship, and because Sister J lacked the spirit of discernment and was not watchful as is commanded by the Lord, watch and pray that you fall not into temptation, she went astray and fell deep into the hands of the enemy, and her race could have ended in hell because of carelessness. You can easily identify Satan's agents with the following. They wear rings on one of their big toes, chains around their ankle, nose rings, unusual bangles, etc. They could enter into a church or fellowship and be very zealous in the activities of the group or church, just for a single Christian they are after. Some behave abnormally, others are wicked, etc. That is why the child of God should ask God for the spirit of discernment to enable him or her to identify them at a glance. The moment they know you have recognized them, they make sure they do not come near you, the reason being that their master will warn them about you. In the Market Places They operate in various forms in the market. The market is one of their major areas of operations, just as the hotel is where they lay in wait for men. In the market, they pick their victims, some pregnant women whose miscarriages they cause to enable them to get the blood for their blood banks. Some victims they would accompany to their residence in order to visit such in the nights. This happens to the unbelievers. Certain fanciful products sold in the market, e.g. necklaces, lipsticks, perfumes, and food items such as sardines, queen of the coast, etc., have strange origins. There are certain actions Christians have to watch out for. You might see a lady or perhaps a gentleman who suddenly touches your stomach or any part of your body. The Christian, therefore, should, on experiencing this, give the word of command in Jesus' name, scattering or destroying the plans of the devil, and sure enough, whatever you scatter or bind here on earth shall be so. Cultural Activities It is also very important to note that many people get initiated into Satan's activities or get possessed through most of these cultural ceremonies and dances. Most of our cultures are demon-oriented, some through friends, others through reading some pamphlets or novels. Demons hover in the vicinity of every idol. They function through idols in the practice of idolatry. Zechariah 10, 2 As a definite part of religion, idolatry ascribes divine power to natural agencies and pays divine honor to a created object. Romans 1, 18 through 22. The scripture defines idolatry as spiritual adultery. Jeremiah 3, 8 through 10. Therefore, a child of God should have no connection whatsoever, directly or indirectly, with idolatry. So-called high life, juju, and disco music are inspired by Satan and his demons. I do remember that before the Lord saved me, in one of the meetings we had with Satan, he said, this world is mine, and I am going to rule the whole world in my power, and would destroy all who believe in the name of the Righteous One. Satan does not mention the name of Jesus. If anyone does that in his presence, he or she stands the risk of losing his life. He promised making those of us his agents, governors, etc. Satan is a liar, and indeed the father of lies. There were also plans to silence the Christians in Nigeria by restricting importation of Bibles and Christian literature. He operates through unbelievers in positions of leadership and authority to initiate anti-Christian policies and programs. He establishes healing centers which would appear very religious and through them claim souls. These centers, usually called spiritual healing homes, are all around us. Here many lying wonders are performed to deceive their clients. Satan is very much aware of the second coming of Jesus Christ and constantly urges his agents to hurry and to be ardent in their operations always saying, We have no time left. 
Dear child of God, Satan is not sleeping. Why must you sleep? Chapter 8 The Believer's Weapons The Name of Jesus The Blood of Jesus The Word of God Christian Praises Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Ephesians six ten through 11 And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Revelation twelve eleven. I have already said much on this earlier, but just to give a few instances, please realize that there is power in that name of Jesus. There is power in the blood of Jesus. The scripture says, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also had highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, 8-11 Again the scripture says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. Revelation twelve eleven. Let the name Jesus always be on your lips. These two, the name and the blood, scatter the plans of Satan, and in fact destroy the strategies of Satan and his agents. Secondly, you must learn to sing praises to God, always. There is power in praises. There was this pastor, Pastor I.K., name withheld. He was pastoring a church in Ebute Meta. He became my target, and his offenses were, number one, he disturbed our peace by carrying out early morning calls, i.e. preaching in the early hours. Number two, he went about with his megaphone and stationed himself at number two bus stop along Akintola Road, Abute Meta. There he would preach. He would not stop at that, but would keep binding demons, etc. Number three, in his church he would preach, exposing the works of darkness, after which he started binding demons. Number four, he prayed a lot. Number five, he was always singing and praising God. I sent my messengers to him, but they could not kill him, so I decided to carry out the mission myself. On the said day, I saw him walking along the new GRA. A thing worth mentioning here about this pastor is, any time we went for him, we would see pillars of cloud by his right and left hands, walking along with him, so these hindered us. But this particular day I saw nothing, so I was doubly sure my mission would be very successful. I commanded rain to fall to enable me to strike him with thunder. The rain started, and the thundering began. All the trees in the area started losing their branches, but this pastor was singing joyfully. I still remember the chorus. In Jesus' name every knee shall bow. As he continued with this chorus, the rain stopped, the thundering ceased. There appeared immediately two angels, one of each side, with flaming swords. Their eyes and the swords were like flames of fire. Then a strong wind carried me away, and I found myself in another town. In fact, I was baffled. But because we were so hardened, what I said was, This man has escaped again. The pastor did not know the spiritual war that was fought on his behalf. So, you can see, the child of God is well secured. When the Bible says, Nothing shall by any means hurt you, it means what it says. The second testimony is about a Christian who boarded the same taxi with me. He was very zealous and started distributing gospel tracts inside the taxi. When he gave me the tract, I rejected it. He started preaching. So I became disturbed and knocked him with the ring on my finger. That was to kill him. This boy shouted, The blood of Jesus! Immediately lightning and fire and an angel appeared. A strong wind again removed me with great force out of the taxi and into the thick jungle. Had it not been that I was a man backed by evil powers, I could have got lost in the jungle. The Christian did not know the war that went on his behalf. All he knew, including the other passengers, was that I had disappeared from the taxi. The name of Jesus, or the blood of Jesus, in the mouth of the believer, sends out fire. The scripture says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it, and is safe. Proverbs 18.10 Dear Reader, if you are a child of God, remember that God has magnified His word above all His name. Psalms 138, 2. Therefore, confess the word, 
the word of God, believing that what you said shall come to pass, and it shall be so. That is God's promise. Again, I would like to mention here that you can only confess what you know. The scripture enjoins us to delight in the word of God, meditating on it day and night. For you to rightly divide the word of truth, you must know it. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom. Again, Psalm 1, 1 through 3 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he also shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water, that bringeth forth its fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Get close to your Bible. Pray without ceasing. Have a singing heart and stand. Exercise the authority given to you by the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 9 Now, what next? The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. Revelation twenty two seventeen. Having read through this testimony, you need no further preaching to give your life to Jesus Christ. The scripture says, The thief, Satan, cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I, Jesus Christ, have come that you might have life, and have it more abundantly. John ten ten. Satan hates you, and has devised various means of taking you to hell with him. That you can testify from this testimony. If Satan makes a promise to you, or even gives you a gift, know that it is ill-intentioned. Satan is a liar, and the father of lies. God called him your enemy. Why not believe God and his word? It is not by accident that you came across this testimony. Examine yourself, and make sure you are in Christ. You will only succeed in deceiving yourself if you choose to remain a churchgoer, and worst of all, if you still decide to put up a nonchalant attitude to this most important decision of your life. We implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. If you are not yet saved, that means if according to the word of God you have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior yet, following by water baptism by immersion, we encourage you to do so without delay. Tomorrow may be too late. This concludes the audiobook, Delivered from the Powers of Darkness, by Emmanuel Amos. Feel free to contact us at Eastern Gate audio at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and may God richly bless you.